Look who decided to come out and play. Nerds. That's what, that's what you are. Bunch of cute fucking nerds showing up to this stream at this time of day. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, gonna be one of those kinds of streams. Unfortunately, I don't have too much time because I've got uh, a raid in two and a half hours, but we can probably do something, you know? We'll probably, we'll probably figure out something fun to do. I have, I have no ideas. I didn't plan anything. Frode with the four months. Whoop whoop. Hey, what's up? How's it going? Thanks for stopping by. Hope you, hope you're going to enjoy the content today. I was going to say my classic, hope you're enjoying the content, but we've had fucking no content yet. <laughs> so what is there to even enjoy yet? Hello, Mr. Streamer. <laughs> How are you this fine evening? I'm doing great. I'm a little bit on the tired side. I got up at like four in the morning. So I'm, I'm a little more tired than I usually am at this time. I mean, at this time, I'm usually getting up, so that's different to me, but it's nice because I got to experience the entirety of the sun existing today, which was, uh, you know, a rare, rare, rare event in this household. <laughs> Get your smelly cheese out of here, peasy. <laughs> what time is it? It is, it is, uh, two in the afternoon, 1400, 1435. Son, yeah, I kind of agree with that. Luckily, it's been cloudy. <laughs> but the outside has provided light to the inside. It is more, more specifically what has been observed today. You guys like my new uh, camera setup here? You like that? You like that? Uh, look at that. You might even think this is a professional stream. But joke's on you. This is a pleb stream. I was zooming that, right? That hasn't frozen. Is that image frozen? Or did I miss that image? No, that image is not frozen. I must have missed it. Ah. That's a crisp camera. Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> is this a Michael Bay stream? So much shaky cam? You know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. You know? That is a crisp camera it's okay i'm actually looking at so <laughs> let's 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 talk for a minute okay i know i'm not in focus right now maybe i'll be in focus if i hit that uh-huh yeah well anyways <laughs> i don't even know if i was in frame I, I could probably flip this thing out so I could actually see if I'm in frame or not. But my camera's kind of mounted in an opposite way. I need to get a monitor for it. Um, but yeah, so I set up my, my Dissler today um, because I was sick of having my ugly ass uh, webcam in the last stream. I looked through some of the video and the quality of it was quite poor. And that makes me sad. I'm, I'm kind of a fan of really high quality everything. I don't like losing information across the way. Um, and also we had problems with uh, focusing where we weren't able to focus on a camera, uh, focus on a phone. And that caused the screen to not be readable on the camera and, or on the phone. And then that made it basically a complete pain in the ass. So um, what I did is I set up my DSLR, which is an old uh, Nikon D5300, which I bought from my microscope. Um, which honestly is pretty dated at, at, in this time. So like, I'm not like super happy about this camera, but, um, basically I have this set up. I have a proper lens. I can manually focus it. I can automatically focus single servo, whatever I want to do. I can get a lot better focus and zoom, um, on the stream. Now, the camera really has no problems. I, I'm able to get uh, 1080p 30 off of the HDMI port, which is acceptable, but I really wish it was 1080p 60 because that's what I do for everything. But anyways, it can only record 1080p 60. Uh, it's pretty dated for all of the uh, con uh, connectivity of it. So we're not able to actually get that into the stream as a live feed. Now, unfortunately, 
I don't have a capture card that doesn't suck. I have an Elgato Game Capture HD from like 2012 or 2013 that I bought mainly so I could remotely manage some uh, computers that I was running fuzz jobs on and I literally didn't have IPMI or enough money to like just go buy servers, right? Um, so it is an absolute piece of shit. Uh, it's USB 2.0, so we're basically bottlenecking on that. It takes about 2.5 seconds for the image to make it into that device and onto the computer. It's a shit ton of latency. It's a complete pain in the ass, and everything absolutely sucks about that device. Now, further, there are no Linux drivers for that. There's a, a hacked-up Linux thing that I've used in the past, but it freezes after, like, 5 to 15 minutes randomly of use, and it basically takes a minute to unplug everything, replug it in, reconfigure everything, and that is not acceptable for a stream, in my opinion. Um, so, what I have is I have a, a Windows VM that I redirect the shitty 2.5 second latency shitty game capture HD into the Windows VM, where I have OBS running in that Windows VM. I then encode things, and I record it to a custom FFmpeg output that UDP uh, broadcasts it, well not broadcast, but UDP unicasts it to my host machine. Then I have a VLC plugin in OBS, which then picks up that stream and throws it into what you fucks are seeing. And then on top of that, I basically had to go through and fuck with delays and fuck with displaying things that kind of made like blips and sounds and everything to make sure all of the audio and all of the microphones are synced up. So the my microphone, my desktop audio, and my camera audio are all synced within a couple milliseconds. And then the camera and computer screen are on the same frame uh, at least at 30 frames a second. So that means if I were to point the camera at the computer and then show a one frame blip, uh, it would be the same frame on both the computer and on the camera. And that was a pain in the ass to set up, and since I'm using uh, all of the like weird remote USB into a VM through UDP to my host, um, those latencies are kind of locked in based on where the keyframe is. And I have a keyframe every second right now. I tried with putting it every single frame, but it didn't really make a huge difference. But basically, every time I start OBS, I just get kind of a random new keyframe, and I have to redo all of my delays. Um, but as long as I don't close this OBS session, everything should be synced up where my, my voice and audio and if I, like, make a sound like that, it will hopefully line up. I don't know, I can't actually hear, um, but that should line up, and that's really good. That took a lot of effort to set all those things up. Um, it was a complete pain in the ass. Uh, that being said, I did order another recapture card. I ordered a uh, like professional AV quality capture card with four HDMI in. Uh, it's a PCI Express capture card, not only USB rubbish. So I'm moving along to something that's a little bit better for that. Um, and I have four inputs because I suspect in the future I might have like a face cam and a bench cam and maybe like a device camera. So having four inputs is really nice. That capture card is able to do um, 1080p at 80 FPS on each of the HDMI ports. Um, I didn't go with a 4K capture card because I don't need it. Um, I don't stream in 4K. I can record to my camera in 4K if I need to. Actually, this camera can't do 4K, but you get the point. If I had a 4K camera, I wouldn't be streaming in 4K anyways, so it doesn't matter. Um, so I opted for the 4-port. There was only a 2-port option for 4K, and it was twice the price. So I basically uh, had a, a 4x cost reduction per HDMI port. I think it was like 800 bucks for the capture card, but it is super nice. It's actively cooled. Uh, it's PCIe-based, and apparently it has 64 uh, lines of latency, which means it's like basically a 20th of a frame is the latency there. So I won't have to adjust delays or do anything there. I can just put everything at zero delay and my, everything should be synced just as is. So I'm really happy with that setup and that's going to hopefully be a lot better. So yeah, that was kind of a pain in the ass, but the capture card that I got 
uh, natively supports Linux and Mac and Windows without any drivers. It's completely driverless. It's got no fancy whiz-bang stuff. It shows up directly in V4L on uh, Linux and on Windows. I think it plumps through direct show. Um, nothing proprietary. You don't need a driver. You don't need a firmware. Everything just... I mean, obviously, it's programmed with a firmware. But anyways... Uh, it's designed and advertised to work on all the operating systems, so I'm super excited about that. Uh, Blackmagic, I looked at Blackmagic, and Blackmagic does work on Linux, but it is still a proprietary driver, and it's not directly V4L. I think they do, um, convert it into V4L, like, they make a driver that not converts it, but registers it as a v4l thing uh but the capture card that i got will literally just work out of the box in linux with no loading of modules or anything else it will just work um and that's really important to me and then i'll be able to get 1080p 60 out of that this camera actually can't output 1080p 60 um but i'm looking at getting a new super fancy uh camera um, as I'm kind of due for an upgrade, this is a little dated. Uh, for photos, this camera is great, um, but for video, um, it might not seem obvious to like a lot of people, but video has come a really far away in eight years. Um, like consumer cameras in the $5,000 and under price range are doing like 4K at 120 FPS or 8K, and this camera barely does uh, 1080p at 60 FPS. Um, and it does 8-bit for its video, and it has really bad night qualities, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I'm looking at getting a Sony, um, uh, A3S Mark III, uh, which came out like a month ago. It's on back order right now, so if I, I don't really have to order one quickly because it probably won't ship until December, um, but I might want to get in that line, but, uh, it's an exceptionally high-quality camera, um, so... Super excited about that. Uh, all right, I'll read chat then. How are you feeding it into OBS? Well, I've got a capture card into OBS, and then I have OBS to OBS uh, communicating through the network. So it's doing some doing some stuff. Um, what's the plan for today? I have no plans. I've got a raid in two hours, so we're probably not going to get too much done, but maybe we'll do stuff uh, through Raid or something. I'm not 100% sure. We'll see. I can always dip out of Raid if we have something really good going, um, but mainly I just wanted to use this to test out my AV setup um, and use y'all as guinea pigs. So, streaming the Raid, maybe. Um, it's a guild Raid, and... Like, my my raid is not actually part of my guild, my or my standard raid, um, but this is just a ZG, uh, which is with my actual raid, so I might want to be able to chat with them and, and just hang out for that. I'm not 100% sure. We'll see. I have a Blackmagic Studio uh, Intensity Pro, which does 4K60, but only as a single input. I use it for my microscope, and yeah, the proprietary driver is annoying, but they're fairly quick to update for new kernels, and it just works in OBS uh, as a capture card in Linux. Yeah, I, that was the second thing that I, I looked at getting, um, the Blackmagics. Um, but I got a, I think it's Magewell. They, they just work out of the box in Linux, and um, obviously to me that's a bigger, uh, bigger value add there. And then... Uh, it's just four ports, so I'll be able to rig that up with a bunch of cameras. If I end up having like a crazy multicam setup in here, um, that will be great for that, for streaming. And then uh, the camera that I'm looking at getting, the uh, 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 A7S Mark III, um, basically can output 16-bit RAW over HDMI, and no capture card supports that, but there are, like, the monitor devices and external recorders that support it. Um, so I don't really care about 4K capturing anything because uh, I'm never going to be streaming in 4K. At least I won't be streaming in 4K in the next, like, four or five years, I don't think. Um, and in that case, I'll just buy a capture card when it comes out. Um but I am thinking about maybe doing some vlogs or something where I walk around and go on hikes and just uh, do like an edited uh, cut down video where I, maybe I just talk about random things on my mind. So, yeah. <laughs> Always super 
co- cozy when watching the folk. Hell yeah, get all cuddled, cuddled up in those blankets. Fuzz the camera. So this camera will, every once in a while, will time out. I think every 30 minutes this camera times out. Um, so if this camera goes blank, uh, just let me know, and I'll just uh, flip the switch. But it times out because it's trying to prevent overheating or some stupid shit like that. Uh, but since I'm not actually recording, um, it's not really encoding or doing anything crazy. It's actually not hot at all to, to the touch. So, But yeah, I was looking at reverse engineering the... Um, the camera firmware, such that we could change that 30-minute uh, delay, um, but I'm probably just going to be buying a new camera anyways, so uh, I'm super excited about that. Uh, I'll be able to basically have, like, cinema-quality um, shots, which will be awesome. Obviously, I won't be able to, like, film in 8K and clip it down to 4K, but if I get my cropping right, it'll look really good. So, Yeah. Can we get a phase view instead of a calculator view? Nah, 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 you gotta earn the phase view. Uh, go to my OnlyFans and commit to the, uh, to send money to the highest tier price bracket. I don't even know what they're called. Um, and then uh, and then you'll get the face cam. <laughs> okay, let me, uh, I see. All right, so, uh, this was the phone that we did up the other day. I'm gonna get, uh, some, a better setup for this shot. Um, did I say camera? I meant to say phone. I don't know what I said. So, we'll, uh, we'll go for a little flight. Just look at the price of the mage wallet. Yeah, they're expensive, but, uh, it's worth it. Okay. So, mainly, I need to figure out a spot to put this camera that gives you a good shot, but also allows me to manipulate the device well, um, and also makes me not hate sitting at my computer. Because right now, a leg is of this uh, tripod is actually going to be kind of getting in the way, you know? Hmm... I can't quite get one leg of this tripod on the table, unfortunately. It's not quite tall enough. But uh, that's looking much better than what we had the other day. And then we'll just give it a little zoomies. I know it's uh, out of focus right now. And this, we'll just, uh, I guess we'll flip it on, get some text displayed such that we can get the focus on a specific area. And it should be aimed pretty straight down. So hopefully this will focus up nicely. Yeah? Yeah? How'd I do? Fuck, that uh, reflection's pretty bad, isn't it? Um, let's see if I face it down more. If we can find a different cycle effectively in that light. Facing it more directly down is better. Anyways, as the focus will be more consistent. Not that it really matters. I don't know what I'm going to be showing on this phone today. Other than maybe uh, just rebooting and panicking, but whatever. It's the thought that counts, chat. There you go. How's that looking? Yeah? Look at that quality right there. And I'm going to be bumping this tripod all fucking night because it's right next to me. Honestly, I should probably move all these other cameras off my, uh, off my desk or uh, all these other phones. I don't know why I keep saying cameras. Also, the monitor uh, looks like that's a different resolution on my camera. So it was cropped in a little bit different of a way than I expected it to be. But uh, we'll just refocus this and we should be good. Yeah? Screen needs a clean I cleaned it yesterday. <laughs> I just have pretty bright lights in here, so uh, you're just going to get glares. Stealing fingerprints right now. <laughs> okay, and then I should be able to have this microphone here. Uh-huh. Look at that. So let's go put this into... Uh, um... 
I was trying to look through the display and it was pretty tough. I think I can, there's like a developer things, applications, development, stay awake. Screen will never sleep while charging. Okay. So sweet. Now we can, uh, I don't know. Do we just uh, panic the phone quick? Is that fun? I don't know if that's fun. Look at that seamless transition. God, I'm such a good streamer. Fuck. This is this is what your hard-earned donations go to. Is uh, this high-quality streaming environment? All right, we'll go. Uh, we'll go and panic this quick. I'm typing the wrong window. Um, thrower. Uh, okay. We'll just um. Uh, how do we want to panic this? I guess we can just do a uh, standard pointer, uh, right volatile, uh, leet as mute U64 and write a zero into it. Uh, huh? Something like that. That should panic it, right? Mm-hmm. I did some LSs to get that on screen. Look at that. I'm I'm paying so much attention. And then we just run make. Oh, <laughs> it's not it's, it's not it's not uh <laughs> I have a different phone plugged in. Actually, I have no phone plugged in right now. See, that's how good of quality we have going on in this stream. Um we don't even know what phones are working on because that is the production value. So, I'll uh Get this reframed. Oh, yeah. Look at that. That is art right there. Okay, that's plugged in. We should be able to ADP shell now. Um, CPU info. Sweet. It's the Sunfire. Um, make and... Uh, oh, make run. There we go. Ship it out. And... Oh, it died. We did it. We panicked a phone with an arbitrary kernel execution bug. Wow, how impressive is that, chat? How impressive is that? <laughs> Mr. Professional Streamer, hell yeah. Only the highest quality content on this stream. How is that, how is that quality looking? Does that look good? Are we happy with this? Is this impressing people as much as it's impressing me? Because I'm like, damn, we're really good at this. Uh, let me pick a different focus area uh, right there. There we go. Hell yeah. Bam. God, that reboot time is insane. <laughs> I'm dribbling as we speak, sir. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Quality emote. <laughs> dual core reboot time. Oh, is it a dual core? All right. Um, so we looked at this phone and we wrote an exploit for it. Is there anything? Uh, should we go through the exploit? Should we talk about that? Basically, we can either go through and discuss what we actually did the other day because I don't think I explained it very well while I was streaming. Um, or we can pretend to do something else for the next two hours before I go to raid, um, and abruptly end whatever I'm doing. So, uh, how do we, how do we want to do that? Doesn't that look good? Should I turn up the brightness? Is that a, is that an option? Does this version of Android have brightness? Is that a, is that a thing? Display <laughs> brightness. Automatic? Nope. Just max. Just max. Look at that now. That is some high quality Android. Did that make it less readable? Did that screw up white balance? I don't know if that helped or hurt. I think that actually hurt for, for y'all. It honestly kind of washed it out pretty bad. We'll put it back on automatic. I think automatic was doing, doing just okay. There we go. A little bit better contrast. So, um, unless it's just not focused, but 
There you go. Now it's focused. All right. High quality. <laughs> have you ever tried exploiting custom QMage image format vulnerability in Samsung? I have no idea what that is. So no, I I haven't. Um, I pretty much only do O'Day. I'm not I'm not a huge fan. Oh, you know what? That actually looked great. Um, I'm just looking at a pleb quality uh, Twitch stream. I really need to get uh, integrations into um, into my OBS for Twitch chat so I can actually look at the real output rather than like whatever I'm seeing on the Twitch side of things. That's the P0 bug that Juro wrote about earlier this year. Nah, I don't remember. I don't remember. There's too much shit that comes out <laughs> to really keep track. Okay, so um, what we can do is, um, is there anything we really need to polish on this exploit? I don't think so. Um, we could go and move these things into a different file, and we could put this on GitHub. Not that it matters, because no one has this device in the world. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Well, chat's not telling me what I'm supposed to be doing, so... Um, what we're gonna do then is uh, we're just gonna we're gonna go and take a look at this other phone, which we tried to use uh, USB on the other day, um, but unfortunately, um, it didn't work. And then I rebooted my machine, my machine, and then it did work. And I think that ultimately comes down to um, not rebooting the machine, but I added myself to the USB group uh, for a different thing. And my guess is that old ADB maybe used libUSB, and modern AB, ADB actually has like a kernel driver. Um, and I probably had permissions to use that kernel driver, but I didn't have permissions to do direct like raw USB. Um, so whatever it is, I can now ADB shell into this. Um, <laughs> just super fancy. But uh, what we can do is we can do something really interesting here. We're gonna do something called cat proc CPU info, and then we're gonna play a game with chat, and we will go and explain that other exploit. Where This is just a very small tangent here because I'm, I'm very proud of what I found here. I'm gonna run this, and then chat, you have to point out what is weird about this device. Here we go. Do 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 That my friends is a Giselle in the wild We might as well be on the BBC right now because we are finding obscure ass animals in our devices and we'll get this display all fancy on here too applications developments stay awake perfect absolutely cursed do you not like giselle because i'm pretty happy about that i haven't seen i don't, like i mean I'd say I haven't seen a Giselle device, but I obviously I own this, and I've owned this for 10 years. Um, but I didn't know this was Giselle, uh, which is pretty crazy. If no one understands why this device is so strange, uh, this has an ARM extension called Giselle. That is indicated by where this says Java, and when this, says, uh, when this has a suffix of a J. Uh, and Giselle was this magical great idea that ARM d people had uh, to run... I think like Dalvik VM, not Dalvik VM, uh, JVM opcodes uh, directly on the CPU. Uh, basically, you can have hardware acceleration of Java, as fucking disgusting and useless as that is. And that's why it's so exciting when we come across a Giselle device, because it's one of the dumbest extensions ever added to a CPU architecture ever. Um, which is super, super, super fun. So, yeah, isn't that cool? Um, anyways, we have that device. We can probably uh, land a bug on that. We do have two hours before I have raid, and that probably gives us enough time to land an exploit on that device. <laughs> um, 
I think that's the oldest Android device I have here, except for my ADP One, my Android Dev Phone One, which was the original uh, Android Dev Phone, which unfortunately um, uh, I had someone sit on and broke the USB port on it, and thus it doesn't charge. And uh, I think I kind of fucked up a uh, bodge soldering when I was 18 or 17 trying to solder that, and I. I think I just damaged it even more. But uh, if I go find a G1 off uh, eBay, I probably could repair it and just uh, take out that uh, power control board. But yeah. Anyways, so the other day, uh, which was yeah, two days ago, um, two days ago, we uh, wrote an exploit for this lovely phone here. This is called a Motorola Electrify. Um, and it is, I think, very specific to the U.S. cellular carrier, which was my carrier when I was growing up as a kid. Um, however, um, I think there are similar Motorola devices to this. Um, I, I'm, I highly doubt they made this for my tiny-ass small-town carrier. Uh, it's probably just a renaming of an existing Motorola device. Uh, and I think we saw some of that yesterday um, when we were looking through, or two days ago, when we were looking through information about the devices. Um, but this is an old Android phone. This is uh, harking back to, I think, 2010 or 2011 is when this phone came out. And we can see everything that this is running. Um, I guess we might as well just go into full screen mode here. Um, this is running... Uh, Android version 2.3.5, uh, which is relatively dated. We can go and check out the artwork for that. For all those people interested in Android uh, artwork, if you hit the build button a bunch of times, um, or the Android version, uh, you'll get this Android pop-up. And this works to this day. If I were to grab a more modern phone, which I am figuring out right now... Um, you can do the same thing if you've never done it before. So this is, um, let's see if I can do this here. Um, just making sure there's not any info in here. I don't know if there is, but this one's probably the most boring one I've ever seen. It just says Android 10. That's fucking pathetic. Uh... But yeah, historically they've had like art. I guess they kind of have ditched that. We can uh, maybe grab another device here uh, and boot that one up. But yeah, all these Android phones have like little, it's not really an Easter egg, just a little piece of art in there. And we'll wait for that phone to boot. But anyways, the phone that we exploited was uh, Android uh, 2.3.5, which I don't remember what year that was. Probably uh, 2010, 2011. Maybe 2012, I think probably 2010, maybe even 2009. Um, and then this is running Android kernel uh, something, uh, 2.6.32.9, uh, which is really, you know, pretty old at this point, 2.6. So anyways, that was the device that we wrote an exploit for, and we can go and talk about uh, what we actually did to that. So. Um, all right. So basically, what we did is we went through and grabbed the source code for this device, um, which we put into uh, Motorola, where we've been kind of working on everything. So first of all, we downloaded a signed release build of this 19.0 version of the firmware, which is exactly um, what we have on here, and we reflashed it, and we made sure that we flashed a stock official build that signed with no modifications onto the device to wipe it to a clean slate such that we're actually looking for O'Day. I guess who even knows if it's O'Day because someone could have found this and reported it 10 years ago and we don't know. Uh, but we didn't know that ahead of time. So to us, it's the same process as if it were actually an O'Day. And I would hazard it's probably an O'Day. This is a relatively obscure device. I can't imagine people have done uh, much auditing on this. So we have the kernel here, which we were able to download for this uh, uh, Android device. So all Android devices are kind of required in some legalese way uh, of providing the source code um, for whatever they added or changed on Linux or Android. Um, and that means that you typically are able to rebuild kernels for these devices. And especially an old device like this that has no bootloader protections, you can kind of flash whatever you want on it. At, at least on this one, I think I actually had to... Maybe use a bootloader exploit to unlock the bootloader, but anyways, we put an official build kernel on there, so it doesn't really matter um, whether or not it is unlocked or not, because we can always flash that onto it. But, 
Um, so effectively what we did is we ADB shelled into the device. Um, I'm just making sure it's the one that's plugged in, and it is. This is the Sunfire, is the uh, hardware for this. And all we did is we went into dev, and we kind of looked through random devices on this uh, phone, which we have access to as our current user on this ADB shell, uh, which is a relatively privileged user back in the day. Um, it was kind of the same privilege as everything else. There wasn't much sandboxing. But nowadays, a shell, uh, like ADB shell, has a lot more permissions than what you would have in a browser sandbox or other environments. So typically, when I'm looking for device driver bugs like this, I'm looking for like a bootstrapping uh, or development exploit. I'm looking for a bug that allows me to get execution in a signed kernel, which will then allow me to do research on the signed device. Um, so typically I'll be looking for the shittiest bug, the least valuable bug, the most unreliable bug. I don't give a shit. If I have to literally let the phone reboot and rethrow overnight when it does 10,000 different exploit attempts before I land, I'm totally fine with that. That's completely acceptable for a development bug because once I get kernel execution once, I should be able to kind of embed myself in the kernel and open up some arbitrary kernel execution paths that are more reliable, and until I reboot that device, unless I do persistence, which is expensive in itself, um, allows me to kind of continue getting execution on the device. This is an old enough Android device that we don't really have any mitigations for anything. There's no SE Linux, there's no PXN, there's no SMEP, there's no SMAP, I guess SMEP is PXN, um, there's no kernel ASLR, there's no uh, KPP, there's like, it, basically you can just execute whenever you want, pretty much. Uh, as we sh saw the other day when it took us about two hours to get kernel execution on this. Anyways, um, we kind of went through and looked through these devices, and one of the devices that stood out to us was this NVOS device, which, while it requires your a root user or a root group, um, it's also read-writable to all other users on the system, which means all users on the system have full access to this NVOS device and can communicate with this. So, uh, then we wanted to actually figure out where this NVOS device is used, so we uh, search for NVOS kind of through the kernel, um, and we'll very quickly find that something will probably mention, uh, we can probably search for it in quotes, um, and here we have uh, one listing, which is this NVOS user in Moctegra, um, and it registers a device called NVOS here. And this is basically the structure that it uses when it registers this with Linux. We're not going to go into too many of those details, but basically it's going to get registered uh, during the init phases of this driver. Now, what that's going to do is register this file operations, this FOPS structure. So file operations here, and that file operations is going to basically define some entry points to this driver based on user interactions. So open, of course, is exactly what happens when a user calls open on that device. So open, you know, quote, uh, dev slash NVOS, end quote, ORD, read write will end up uh, causing this NVOS open code to get executed, well, which is basically going to set up this private data. Private data is kind of like a generic context uh, that Linux allows you to attach information to an open file. So here it's basically allocating this private data and then assigning this private data to this uh, device, and that's kind of how this device has attached custom state to this uh, file which has been opened by Linux. We can see that there's NVOS close, which is registered for release. That's what gets called when you close things. If you look at that, I'm sure that's just going to go in free. Uh, yeah, it's going to go through private data and kind of clean up anything that this driver has done. Um, next, there is NVOS ioctl, which is what, get, what gets invoked when you uh, call ioctl on this device. And then NVOS nmap, which is what gets called when you nmap on this device. And this VMA structure, this VM area struct actually contains... Uh, the information, um, I don't know why I don't have, uh, C tags here. Uh, I think I generated them. Uh, maybe I ended up removing kernel and re-extracting it when we were doing builds yesterday. I'm not 100% sure, but, uh, we'll let these C tags regenerate quick. 
Um, any chance we're gonna see one live from the Nexus 5? Still my favorite Android phone. I don't have a Nexus 5. Actually, maybe I do. Um, I would have to dig through some boxes. But anyways, the VM area struct basically has all of the arguments that are passed to Nmap. Um, but we didn't care about that. We care about Ioctal. And Ioctal is typically the most interesting surface in a driver because it's where it just handles arbitrary custom user commands. And in this case, you literally pass it the integer, which is the command, and the arg, which is the argument that you pass it. These are fully and completely controlled by a user, both of them, every single bit with no constraints of anything. All values are valid and will cause this code to get executed. Um, so we can see here it's going to switch and uh, switch on that command to determine what function to actually do based on that command. Um, and then further inside of there, um, it'll take an arg, and this arg, it'll interpret as many different things. It'll cast it to pointers and convert it to structures. It might be a pointer to a structure of structures, a pointer to a string. It might be an integer itself. That argument is so fluid in what it can be that there's really no standard way of actually going about uh, doing this research. You just kind of have to read the code or reverse out whatever you're looking at to figure out what form format these ioctals are in. So pretty quickly, we found this uh, sem clone structure, which was interesting. It has no constraints of reaching that. You don't have to have any certain state. You can just go directly into sem clone. Sem clone takes an argument, which is the user controlled value. It then interprets that as a pointer in the kernel, uh, which is a little bit dangerous, but it then does this envos copy in, which is a wrapper around copy from user, which safely reads. Um, that data basically treats that as an untrusted pointer to untrusted data and it makes a copy of it into the kernel. So it, it basically copies the uh, clone param structure into this stack based uh, clone param structure and voila, everything's good here. Um, but unfortunately, if we take a look at what that structure actually contains, uh, it contains these semaphore handles for original and new. And if we look at these semaphore handles, they are uh, pointers to semaphore records. So we still control two pointers now instead of one pointer. And if we take a look at what this does, this will go into uh, semaphore clone. And that takes a handle. Both of these are completely user controlled. And we can see that it immediately starts doing accesses on that pointer. So this is the bug. Uh, in this situation, if it is a non-null pointer to the original val, this, if the original field of that structure uh, is non-null, it will then increment uh, a value based on to where it's pointing into. So ref count, I think, is offset some, I don't know, like 14 hex or something from a ridge. But basically, you are able to get an arbitrary increment, an plus one, to a 32-bit value in memory. Then it's going to go into the sem handle search, where it's going to potentially free th uh, Actually, it's not going to free things here. Here, it's just searching for, um, uh, searching in an RB tree for the handle itself. And we actually rely on this behavior because what we want to do is we want to give the kernel a pointer that we want to increment such that we can corrupt memory in the kernel because it will just use a pointer and increment it. And then if we look at the sem handle search, uh, because we haven't returned yet, right? So we've, we, we've accomplished a primitive that we can make an exploit out of, right? An arbitrary increment in the kernel is a great enough primitive for us to build whatever sort of exploit we want to do on this device with these mitigations that we have. But unfortunately, that's not the end of the day. We have provided a corrupted object, uh, which is the semaphore handle, and we need to make sure that it's valid enough such that uh, execution doesn't cause other crashes or other side effects. So what we want to do is we want this increment, which is actually the first memory modification that occurs in this ioctal. So this is the first point where things could be corrupted and that's fine because we're using that to corrupt the thing we want to. But then if we look at sim handle search, what we want to do is get an early exit. And what we see is that if this h root rb node, this sem4 handle, if it points to uh, a null uh, rb tree, if it's an empty rb tree, it returns out early. Uh, is error or null is basically looking for an error no value or null, which is something in the range of like negative 128 uh, to zero inclusive or something like that, right, in that ballpark. Anyways, if we provide a null pointer, um, for this root RB node, then it will return null, which will then cause this to be uh, 
uh, caused this to fail. Um, honestly, I didn't even look. I thought this was on not equal to null check. But if it does fail, uh, then it's going to go into here and try to insert um, into that RB tree, which honestly... <laughs> I didn't even know the side effect existed. So good thing uh, we actually looked through this because technically there's another side effect here. Um, it's gonna downright on that semaphore, which is fine. That's not controlled by us. While new, um, new is going to immediately be null, so that gets skipped. It's then gonna allocate this and then insert that into there. So we're actually going to corrupt things. Um, yikes, I didn't even know that. Uh, oh well, it doesn't really matter in this case, uh, basically it adds a constraint that, um, some things might get written to that RB tree, uh, afterwards, and if we see new, it's going to allocate something and then link that into data and insert that into, uh, root, okay, um, it probably doesn't really matter in this case. But anyways, constraints like that are really important, but then we see that it's uh, going to return an error here if it fails. Otherwise, it's going to pop out with that semaphore and copy that out and return it back to user. In fact, I think we can use that as a pointer leak, but it, we don't really need it. Anyways, um, that has established the constraints that we have on the bug. We're basically able to arbitrarily increment something at an offset, which is um, uh, we give a pointer in this h -a ridge. And then that will go into the semaphore clone where it will increment something at offset ref count. So whatever the offset of ref count is in that structure, the semaphore structure, um, is what will get incremented. And then some things might happen to stuff afterwards kind of based on where this root node is. In that case, that will return null. Um, and then is this going to actually do anything? So that's going to do nothing. It's going to allocate this thing. And... I guess it might replace the root thing. So it might actually write a pointer in memory a couple bytes afterwards. So um, that's actually incorrect from what we thought the constraints were of the bug, but whatever. Anyway, so uh, we wrote an exploit for this. And what we did is uh, we made something that we called implant. Um, we don't want to, since it's an increment bug, uh, implant. Since it's an increment-based bug, we don't actually want to keep rethrowing the bug, as that would change the values over and over. We're not writing something with a concrete value, so the previous execution matters. Thus, we register kind of a way in the kernel of communicating whether or not the exploit has been thrown on the system. Um, and that way, we don't end up rethrowing it and causing a crash because a value was pre-incremented to an unknown state. So here's kind of the code that we have. Uh, we end up creating this trampoline, which basically will allocate RWX memory at a fixed point in user space. In this case, it's going to allocate it at this kernel trampoline address, which is 18, 180,000 hex. Doesn't matter, it's just uh, where we place that. Um, we make sure that the allocation succeeds, and we placed it there. We get a mutable reference in Rust to it. And then we add a little bit of code to that location that will basically do an indirect jump based on the word at uh, offset 8 in this newly allocated thing. So we basically have a load relative uh, PC and then a branch to that location. And then we have a word here. So this is kind of what we want to jump execution to. And this word can be controlled in user space to affect where it will actually branch in the kernel. So it will allow us to swap out where we want execution to start uh, by changing out that word in the kernel. We then return out that trampoline structure. And then uh, we call trampoline update, and we basically update it to use the install check. And what that's going to do is replace those eight bytes, which is that function pointer, with the function pointer that was provided here, uh, and write that out. And by registering the install check, uh, this is the code that will end up running um, if we were to trigger our exploit or jump to more specifically our implanted uh, function pointer. So that will just return zero. Now by default, uh, that function is not registered. We're actually overwriting a file operation for fsync on this NVOS device. So we're using an unused field in the file operation structure and we're registering a new handler for fsync. Um, and thus by default, since it's not implemented, it will return an error. So by by inserting something that returns zero, we will actually get a success. So we update that trampoline to indicate 
please invoke that code um, when we try to access this implant. Um, then we open the NBOSS device and we attempt to do an F-Sync on that device. So this is going to attempt to call the um, F-Sync thing, which is the function pointer we're replacing. So by default, it's not handled, and thus this would return failure. It would basically return non-zero, some negative like error no value. And due to that, uh, we basically check whether or not our implant is installed on whether or not F-Sync returns zero. And if it does, then we know it's installed and we print that install status. If the implant has not been installed yet, then we actually want to use our exploit and throw our exploit against this device. So what we do is we, um, for zero to kernel trampoline address, uh, we are going to increment the value at this address. So we say this value, um, this is the address of NVOS uh, file operations, and then we add 3C hex, which is the offset of the F sync uh, file operation pointer. And we basically throw that kernel trampoline address times. And that's because we are incrementing a value by one. Thus, we want to invoke this ioctal for the address number of times, and that will result with that pointer being updated to being the kernel trampoline address in the kernel. Um, and that's what that does. So by the time this code is done, that lo this uh, pointer here has been incremented in the kernel by kernel trampoline address times, aka it holds the kernel uh, trampoline address. Then we check whether or not there's a successful install. If there was, we print implant successfully installed, and if it uh, wasn't successful, then we return an error and we basically say, I, I, we don't know what's going on. Maybe your function pointer's wrong. Maybe your offsets are wrong. Um, but then it returns back with this um, with this object, basically holding the uh, device open and uh, returning reference to that trampoline. Then what we can do is we can. Uh, that's the end of that. So that's created the implant, and it's basically used the exploit to install an arbitrary. Uh, code execution primitive into the kernel that we can now use cleanly and reliably because it's it's we're not rethrowing the exploit, which is really cool. Um, so then what we do is we uh, I think we were playing around with something here. I don't think I actually need this foo here. Uh, oh yeah, foo I was using to dump the kernel. So we had that as an example of uh, just dumping that kernel out to user space, um, but. What we have is we implemented something on implant that allows us to run something as kernel. So what we say is, hello, uh, I would like to run kernel code, this function, as kernel. And that is an unsafe extern fn kernel code, which returns a u32. And this is the code that will get executed in the kernel. And in this case, we end up uh, basically having two constants. These are addresses of the commit creds and prepare kernel cred functions in the kernel. We then uh, turn them into function pointers. So we can say um, uh, the addresses of commit creds and prepare kernel cred uh, for this kernel. So we use that to uh, get those addresses. Then here we uh, convert the addresses into their respective function pointers. So that has created them into function pointers. And then this is uh, commit uh, kernel creds as this process. And then uh, return one, two, three to indicate success. Right. So what this is going to do is um, kernel code returned this. This is going to run this function as if we're in the kernel, because it will run it in the kernel. So run as kernel, all that's going to do is update the trampoline to uh, jump to function instead of uh, where it was going before, which was the install check. And then we call fsync, uh, which will actually invoke that. And then we return the u32 from that function back to the user, such that you have a way of returning a value back. Um, and then we call bin sh, and this is uh, just uh, pop as shell. So this is going to uh, get root access, and this is going to be um, throw uh, install the uh, implant via the uh, exploit, right? So then if we run this, make run, um, and don't delete random things, which I felt like I felt that, this is going to run, and we should get 
a root shell, and we do. So um, we have now rooted this phone. So it's a relatively clean and simple exploit. There's really nothing complex about it. Uh, here's the actual exploit. I guess we didn't talk about that. Um, this increment address. So we create this uh, semaphore clone parameter structure. We zero it out. We then fill in that original um, href uh, address in the um, in that structure, and then we take the address that we want to increment in the kernel, we subtract a 14 hex, which is the offset, uh, that 14 hex is the offset of ref count in the orig uh, structure, in that semaphore structure, um, and then all we do is we invoke that. So we basically say, uh, I would like to increment this value, and we call the ioctal with the semaphore clone um, to cause that to happen. So that's all it took, right? That is the exploit in a nutshell. Simple. Yeah, that's it. That's all we really did the other day. I think that was like 10 minutes. That was pretty fast. But yeah. Okay, so that's pretty much the, the simplest you can get for a, an Android kernel bug. Um, this basically is relying on having almost no mitigations in the kernel, actually pretty much none. We have no SE Linux. Uh, we're able to directly uh, prepare and commit kernel creds, which is not something you can do anymore. Um, basically, uh, where do things go awry here? So if we want to talk about things that would not work, anymore. Um, as of Android 4.4, um, pretty much all Android devices switched to using PXN, which is uh, page execute never or something. I, I don't know. Basically, PXN um, disallows you from executing uh, user land code directly in the kernel. So it means that if you want to execute arbitrary code in the kernel, you have to copy it to the kernel before you execute it, which adds another layer of indirection. Um, that would bite us in the way that we're actually executing this code in user space. You wouldn't be able to just jump to this function in user space um, the way that we're doing this. this. This code literally exists in user space and the kernel just jumps to user space because it happens to share our mappings while we are in that ioctal handler. Um, so that wouldn't work. Uh, basically, to bypass that mitigation, we would have to make a copy of this code into the kernel, uh, which is typically not too hard. Um, we're using uh, fixed addresses here, these NVOS uh, file operations addresses here. Um, obviously, using a fixed address is going to be mitigated by uh, kernel ASLR, although there are some exceptions to that. Um, but for the most part, we would need a leak to determine where to actually uh, place this thing in the kernel. We couldn't use a hard-coded address because it would vary uh, from boot to boot. Um, getting a kernel leak on a device like this is pretty trivial, especially up through like Android 7 or 8 era. Um, it's still pretty easy to get kernel leaks. You can find them pretty much all over the place, even to this day. Um, so... It's not that strong of a mitigation, uh, to be honest, for LPEs, but it is a big mitigation for remote code execution bugs, so it's important to not diminish the value of ASLR. It's actually very important. Um, so basically, we would have to find another bug that would give us a leak such that we could construct this address. We would then have to copy this code into um, a kernel space, which would requires to either find a code cave where we can insert it, we would have to allocate RWX memory in the kernel that we can copy or write new code into um, and change that up, and that can be a pain in the ass. We might have to manipulate page tables. We might have to uh, get better execution such that we can call um, allocation routines in the kernel and actually copy and map that memory in. Um, it's not trivial to do that. Further, we're going to probably have issues on a modern device because basically ever since like Android 5 or 6, uh, on most devices there are things protecting you from directly um, mapping RWX memory in the kernel and creating new things. Everything is typically signed, so introducing unsigned code to the kernel is made very difficult. Um, on Samsung devices, they have uh, uh, KPP, is it? 
is KPP iOS or is that uh, Samsung? I can't remember. Whatever it is, um, there's a mitigation that basically involves a hypervisor running on the system and protecting access to page tables and other critical data structures, including these credential structures, um, in that hypervisor, which prevents the kernel with arbitrary kernel execution from modifying some of those uh, structures such that it makes it a lot more difficult to get arbitrary code execution in the kernel. Um, finally, this commit creds prepare kernel creds. I don't think that's worked since like Android 4.2. Uh, Android 4.4 and beyond, I think uh, mostly a switch to SE Linux. I think Android 4 is when SE Linux was introduced, but it was often in permissive mode. And then they started locking it down in like 4.4 era and definitely 5 and beyond. Um, and when uh, SE Linux went in, often a lot of things went in that made it so that you couldn't just get root by setting yourself to root creds. Like, I would actually have a root shell. If this were SE Linux, I would type ID and it would say your root, uh, but I wouldn't be able to access anything because I have to also update all of the SE Linux privileges that my uh, account has, which is actually an absolute pain in the ass because SE Linux doesn't have a very standardized way of operating. Obviously, now it has more of a standardized way and those data structures are a little bit more concrete, um, but making a an exploit that updates your SE Linux uh, tokens and context uh, is an absolute pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> a standard LPE for Android in this day and age, uh, where you actually want a root shell, is going to be like thousand lines of code, probably minimum. It's a, it's a lot more work than this. Um, and in this case, our code is relatively polished. Um, this exploit you could probably write in about 15 lines of C, but we have a lot of comments and a lot of abstraction and a lot of things to make things look cleaner. Uh, but ultimately, this could be a much, much, much simpler proof of concept. So, um, in, in modern Android, it's a lot easier to get kernel execution than root. Um, basically, you can get arbitrary kernel execution, but then actually making a user get root permissions uh, is a pain in the ass. Um, and often that takes another half of the time. So, I haven't done Android stuff in a while. I haven't done it since like Android 7 or 8. Uh, but on Android 8, it would typically take like three or four days to find uh, two bugs, a leak, and an O day that gets you execution. And then it takes like two weeks to actually weaponize the bug, and then another two weeks to figure out how to get root. Uh, so it takes like a month and a half to do an Android bug. Um, and that was on Android 7 and 8. And I had uh, KPP bypasses or whatever, RK RKP I think is Samsung's. KPP is iOS, RKP I think is uh, Samsung. Um, so anyways, um, it's gotten a lot harder, right? The, the, the two hours here, that was not a fluke, right? Like back in Android 2 and 4.2 days, I could reliably find and exploit like three bugs a week right? That was pretty easy. Like, I could just have a random phone that I buy, and I could find and root it in a day or two. Um, but nowadays, it takes significantly longer to do bugs, um, and I'd argue it's probably in the, like, two or three month territory, and that is for an expert. That is not for an average person to do that. An average person, an average hacker that you see walking around at a DEF CON, can't do stuff like this. Um, not not saying they aren't capable of becoming capable of doing it, uh, but this is a pretty niche skill set. So that's important to understand. Um, hopefully that's not confusing or insulting. It's not meant to be insulting. It's just a very niche uh, skill set to have. There are probably in the orders of a couple hundred people in the world who can do uh, exploit dev on modern devices in a offensive capability. It's it's a handful of people who can do it. Um, but yeah. Um, talking about Nox, nope. I, I think I'm talking about RKP. Uh, Nox, I don't think I've ever run into Nox. Um, I think RKP might be rolled up in um, 
Nox, like it might be part of Nox or something. Uh, it wasn't initially, it was initially like an intern project at Samsung to add that kernel in. Um, they had some pretty bad, uh, basically they added like indirect uh, jump protections. This is back in like 2015 or 2016. Uh, they added like indirect jump protections, uh, but they sucked. They were really easy to bypass. Um, but they got the ball in motion and they got the framework in place, right? The hard part about making mitigations is getting them rolled out and getting the harnessing in a way that you have thunks that allow you to have these hooking points where you can pass fail certain uh, situations. So the hard part, for example, like a syscall filter, right? The hard part of a syscall filter is not actually filtering the syscalls, um, it is having the mechanisms in place that you can intercept syscalls and potentially filter them. Uh, so RKP very early on added those hooking points and definitely had some kind of weaknesses and mistakes in basically the way they actually checked for validity. Um, but it got the ball in place and they've improved uh, those checks. So... Um... Have you ever sold exploits to Intel agencies or companies like Zerodium? I have not. Um, also, that's not a very good question to ask offensive people. But, no. I'm not a huge fan of, like, Zerodium and that kind of style of work, to be honest. It's not necessarily my, my jam. I think it's uh, too risky to kind of know what's going to end up happening with your bugs. And... Uh, Zerodium is going to sell them to literally every person who is willing to buy them. Um, and you'll find, like, I know people who've sold Zerodium bugs, and you'll see them show up in the news being used for human rights violations. So, you know, just be careful with your shit. I'm not saying necessarily Zerodium specifically. I mean, like, companies like Zerodium, the, the like, Public bug buying programs that offer the highest prices are typically selling to every fucking country they can, um, indiscriminately. So, yeah, not really my cup of tea. That being said, uh, I don't really look down on people for doing it because it is really interesting work, um, and it's a way to pay the bills, and, like... If that is the morals you align with, then I might question your morals, but I also, like, recognize your bias, right? You know, I'm in the U.S., I grew up in the U.S., that means I'm aligned more with the U.S., and a Chinese citizen who grows up in China is going to be aligned with China, and we're both fucking brainwashed, right? Both of us are, and there's really no reason to rip on one or the other, um, because ultimately, like, their morals align 100% with everything they've been fed and told, and so have mine, right? Like, my morals, uh, in the U.S. are definitely not the cleanest, um, and unfortunately, like, I think it's pretty bad to criticize people's decisions based on morals that they haven't been given an opportunity to evaluate, if that makes sense. So... I think it's an, I think it's important to understand that when people do offensive work in those capacities, um, that typically they don't see anything wrong with it, and it's not because they are malicious or because they're trying to be bad, or it's just they've either convinced themselves that they're doing good things, or they didn't even need to be convinced. Right? Ultimately, everyone's going to think that they are a good person at the end of the day, and that's an important thing to understand. Um, let's see. Should I be worried about still using a Samsung J5? I mean, I don't think a J5 has gotten updates, um, so basically you're vulnerable to pretty much every single person in the world getting access to your phone. So... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Unless J5s are still getting updates, but I highly doubt it. I bet they're stuck on, like, Android 7 or 8, so you're kind of fucked, right? Like, for probably $1,000, someone can get into your phone. Um, <laughs> that's just kind of 
That's what you get when you use old devices, but also that's not necessarily your fault. Uh, that's more Samsung's fault for not maintaining it, or you could even argue it's Google's fault for not pushing um, or, or allowing vendors to control their own update cycles, right? Or you can say it's no one, uh, you can say it's the exploiter's fault for actually exploiting. Like, it's fucking security. Everyone sucks, right? If you want security, just run like a flagship uh, Nexus device or a flagship uh, Samsung's device that's currently getting updates, um, or of course iPhones. Uh, iPhones and modern Android phones are basically at parity now. Um, it kind of like every couple months it varies whether or not uh, iOS or Android is harder. Um, iOS historically had much harder mitigations and they were like two years ahead on a lot of their mitigations um but they've since kind of just not fallen behind but we haven't really found new mitigation strategies like as a society we haven't really found the next thing that everyone needs to implement right we keep getting more and more mitigation strategies but nothing has been nearly as massive as as code signing and se linux and uh non-executable or uh, uh like uh wxor x or you know like basically not being able to make uh jittable memory and stuff so ultimately um ios like, Apple code typically is a lot buggier um, when it comes to the mainline stuff. Like, uh, core Android is typically, like, a little less buggy than Apple stuff. Um, obviously, a lot of Apple stuff has gotten a lot better in the past couple of years. Uh, but it was pretty bad for a while where, like, you'd see, like, Ian Beer dropping, like, hundreds of bugs or, you know... 50 plus bugs at a time um and that's not really possible on a device with better code than that <laughs> so oh camera died yeah thanks cheers just did hopefully that comes right back up and i think it will um yeah sweet i am glad yeah i just had to hit the shutter button um, PAC has been quite a good uh, mitigation, even though it's been bypassed in many ways. Yeah, pointer authentication is kind of interesting. Um, it's, yeah, I would say with modern exploit techniques, it's still not crazy hard yet. Basically, Ever since ASLR went in, you need reliable leaks. And if you have reliable leaks, you can pretty much exploit anything. Because if something can do JIT or something can do indirect dispatch like C++, um, if you have a leak, you can camouflage yourself enough to blend in to be an actual user of the device. You can make your pointers correct. You can allocate correct things. You can maybe uh, use like function oriented programming to like bootstrap yourself to create a valid object. Um, and then maybe like exploit some type confusions on it to actually get uh, like basically with a leak and a good like right primitive you can pretty much bypass anything and you'll always be able to do that um computers are turning complete and basically you can kind of always with a read and a write make things execute different things so um now that doesn't mean it's not more difficult and takes a lot more time and makes exploits more unreliable and makes things uh take months or require massive engineering efforts to actually architect how to make these exploits. Um, but ultimately, if you have a reliable leak and you have a reliable write, you can probably get execution always, regardless of whatever mitigations come in the next decade. So, like, you just, you just kind of can Right, you can you can always make turn complete ROP. You can always make turn complete like data processing and co-op things to do stuff. It just 
it kind of always is possible. So, especially when our company writes shitty kernel code, yeah. I don't know why the iOS kernel is so buggy. I think it's kind of like, I mean, I know this is throwing some major shade. I think it's a lot due to their C++ usage in the kernel. C++ leads to like a lot of boilerplate and shitty coding practices. A lot of, a lot of dynamic dispatch, a lot of function pointers, a lot of objects that be, can be corrupted, a lot of type confusion. Like, of course you can get type confusion in C, but it's not nearly as common because people don't use objects in the same way in C. You typically don't have that, um, like, inheritance in C, and thus you don't really have a reason to cast one object to a different object type. Um... So it's kind of fucky in that regard. Um, they also had like a billion different ways of serializing, deserializing, and doing IPC in the kernel. And obviously serialization and deserialization is a very, very, very common uh, failure point uh, for um, basically <laughs> bugs and, and writing exploitable code. Isn't Google writing their new OS in C++? Probably. Wouldn't be surprised. Um, let's see. God damn, I'm going to time you out because you're just being cringy. That's fine. We don't, we don't do cringy shit here. Um, are you interested in Apple's new arm sock? No, I don't really give a shit, to be honest. Um, are you currently employed? Yes, I am. I, I work at Microsoft right now. Um... Isn't Google writing their... Uh, sorry, I read that. <laughs> Isn't Google writing their new OS in C++? And I think the answer is yes. Um, I got soured on Android when my phone stopped getting security updates. Then shortly afterwards, uh, whoops, broke open completely from the web. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty fair. That's a pretty common thing on Android. IOKid is uh, C++ and man is full of race conditions. Yeah, race conditions are uh, one of the most popular bug classes right now for uh, exploitation. Um, basically, like, all of the tools out there that are designed for fuzzing are incapable of finding race conditions. Like, fuzzing tools are so fucking far from actually finding ODE. Um, like, of course, they'll find, like, basic parser ODE. Um, but a lot of the, the fuzzers that we know and love, uh, with the exceptions of, like, um, the, the kernel fuzzing thing. God damn it, why am I blanking on it? Um, Shit. Well, now that I'm thinking about it, I won't be able to think about it. But uh, the Google uh, kernel fuzzer, uh, which is pretty good. Um, Syscaller, yeah. Syscaller is good, but it also kind of comes down to your um, uh, your definitions of syscalls. And it's also not fantastic for race conditions because there's no great way. Like, syscaller is meant to be fuzzing on live systems. Uh, and since they're not emulated systems, that makes it a lot harder to kind of stutter step and find really tight race conditions. So ultimately, like, syscaller is kind of the only fuzzer that can really find, like, race condition bugs, and it's very Linux-specific. Um, so there's, like, nothing, man. Like, AFL can find bugs in, like... PNG, straight, single-thread parsing things. Like, of course, in theory, it can find race conditions. But ultimately, like, the fuzzers that are out there are so fucking far from finding, like, realistic bugs. Um, it really comes down to harnessing and, and writing a lot of custom code. Like... It, it turns out you're not really going to use AFL to find a Chrome bug. You're not going to use AFL to find a kernel bug. You're not going to use AFL to find a, a remote code execution bug in a, a file protocol. You can. You can hack it up and, and make harnesses and, and stuff for it. But at that point, just write a fucking better fuzzer. Like, write something that implements the spec, right? That, that's what I don't understand so much. Like, AFL is a great bit flipper, so, like, have it as part of your mutation strategy, but if you're fuzzing a kernel or a transactional thing where you're doing syscalls, and you have persistent data, and you're doing, like, multiple operations, and you have a series of events and potentially communication points where you have to take an object that the kernel gave to you and then pass it back to the kernel... 
AFL is so useless in that environment. Like you don't want to, you don't want to corrupt structured pointer data uh, in the way that AFL corrupts things. It's just weird that that is the investment of the world. I, I don't fucking get it. Yeah, I meant fuchsia. Yeah, fuchsia is kind of interesting. I I haven't really paid attention to it in the past couple of years, so I have no idea. Uh, what it's up to. Oops. Didn't mean to bump that. Told you I'd be bumping that all night. Um, do you work custom hours at Microsoft? I mean, I work whatever hours I want. So, yeah. I guess those are custom. Formal methods when? Ah, uh, never. We're never going to have formal methods. How do you write raise condition checking in a fuzzer? Concatenate on file accesses in a multi-threaded programs? No. Like, I... Like... Files are just never really a part of fuzzing. And that's the thing that like is really off with a lot of fuzzers where they're all like file based. In reality, like IPC and sockets and network transactions and syscalls and uh, like RPC events, like none of these things can be modeled very well with a file. Obviously you can structurize them and serialize the events that you're doing into like a PCAP or something, but that's such a terrible way of going about doing it. Typically, if you want to write a fuzzer for anything that's stateful or protocol, you literally just implement a state machine and you fuzz with the state machine. You send a sin and then you wait for the response and then you log the information from that response and log the IDs and the sequences, and then you send another packet with valid sequences such that you're having a communication rather than just jamming random shit into it. Um, typically, if you want to write a fuzzer, it's going to look pretty much identical to writing a program that exercises that behavior. So if, you're, if you want to fuzz a server, you typically write an entire client. If you want to fuzz a client, you typically write an entire server. If you want to fuzz a, a, a kernel, then you write things that use all of the syscalls thoroughly. That's kind of just how it works. It's a lot of work. It's just writing a shit ton of code. You can maybe automate some things by like using some nice markups of, uh, of functions and syscall entry points, and you can regex the shit out of the kernel or do full AST processing of it to figure out ioctal codes and figure out like relations and figure out the uh, types of parameters such that you can try to reconstruct valid syscalls. But at the end of the day, if you want to find really good, deep, reliable, long-lasting ODE, you're gonna have to write some fucking code. <laughs> like, that's just how it goes. So race conditions are in the same boat. You're gonna have to figure out where threads are being used in the target that you're looking at. You're gonna have to figure out, um, what kind of locks are being used. You're going to have to figure out what data structures are being protected by those locks. You're going to want to probably use an emulator to randomly jitter around the scheduler to make sure that when certain objects are accessed that are accessed by other threads, you then preempt and run other threads that you know are going to access those things. It really comes down to everything is a new problem. And that's why security research is so fascinating, because everything is a new problem. Like, when you sit down for an exploit, you don't go flick through your book of like, oh, what do I do when I have this uh, very specific bug where I have an arbitrary increment in the kernel with a user-supplied pointer, and uh, eight bytes after it has to be a null pointer, otherwise I end up corrupting more things in the system and causing an, a heap allocation, and I currently have these mitigations in place on this device, and I have this version of the kernel, and I'm able to get by with these offsets because I have KL sims, and I'm able to plumb that back through, and blah, 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 blah. Like, that, there's no fucking write-up for that. Ultimately... You just have to sit down and think through the constraints and the problem at hand and come up with a solution. And you have to be okay with partial solutions because if you go the academic, like, thorough proof route and you're like, I am I'm going to find all the bugs in this thing, then you're going to find no bugs because you're never going to get anywhere. So, like... Ultimately, you just have to be like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go through and I'm going to make some regex that's going to get every name of every syscall. And then I'm going to get every 
uh, syscall number, and then I'm gonna find all of the parameters to those syscalls, and I'm gonna make a database of random structures, and then when I call a syscall, I'm just gonna pull a random thing from that database and jam it into that syscall arg. And you might be thinking, well shit, that's gonna miss a lot of stuff, and the answer is, it will. And ultimately, those are the sacrifices that you have to make. You have to make those decisions as a security researcher. Is it worth me going deeper than this? Should I go deeper than this? Do I need to go deeper than this? Do I have enough time to go deeper than this? Is this a P equals NP problem? Have we even found a solution to this as humanity? Do I have the compute power to do a wide fuzzing project that goes somewhat deep? How much time do I want to spend on? Like, all of these questions factor into what you do. So whenever you see people talking about fuzzers in the world, you'll see a lot of people criticizing the way people approach things, right? And I'm part of that problem, of course. Uh, once again, just another human. But ultimately, people are going to be like, oh, why, why did you do that? Why did you randomly flip some bytes? Why didn't you use this symbolic execution engine and pull this thing in to arbitrarily fabricate your quantum defibrillator and place that directly into the syscall and caress it and give it a little kiss before you hand it off to the kernel? Well, ultimately, I didn't have fucking time. Or, the other answer, I don't need that to find an O-Day. Or, the third answer, that shit doesn't actually work and I'm just gonna do the thing that does, which is read code. Literally, read fucking code. Read code, understand how it works. When you have something that seems a little too complex, write a fuzzer for it, and then continue reading code while the fuzzer runs, and then find the next thing that you wanna write a fuzzer for, and then write a fuzzer for that. Like, when I think of writing a fuzzer, it's typically for a small amount of a system. I'm auditing an iOctal handler, and I find out, oh, there's a shit ton of bugs in this iOctal handler, I don't really have enough time or interest to go through and figure out which one is exploitable, I'm just gonna write a quick fuzzer for this iOctal handler. It doesn't need to be polymorphic, it doesn't need to magically figure out what the system is, it doesn't need to fingerprint things, it doesn't need to work on every kernel version, it needs to work on this fucking phone I have on my desk with this firmware, with this, with these kernel addresses. That's it. That's all I need it to work for, and that's fine. I'll run it for a day, and then I'll throw it in the trash, like every other fuzzer. Like, that's just kind of how that shit works. I know that's boring. I Like, I know academia wants these solutions that solve everything, and that's what they're working towards, and yeah, that would be great if they worked, but ultimately, like, it's just not how O'Day is done. Masters BTW, thank you so much for the two months of Twitch Prime. Hell yeah. Glad you're enjoying the content. Hell yeah. You sound like George Haas? Like, a voice or just in rants? Because I don't think my voice sounds like his. Um, joined into the best rants on the internet. What is happening? Hell yeah. That's what we do here. We do a lot of rants. That's how we kill time when we have no content to produce, right? Like, I can move this around and, like... Maybe refocus the camera. But that doesn't take away the fact that I have no content planned right now. <laughs> I'm just here to rant. <laughs> uh, you and George do the best rants. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen a lot of the same shit. <laughs> I think we probably think alike, right? It's, it's kind of how a lot of hackers think, right? Uh, un unfortunately, it's not a... It's... Not the most unique mindset, typically. Um, it's a rare mindset, but it's not very unique in the community when you get into it. Um, Chris Wicks with the four months. Whoop, whoop. Thank you so much. Hell yeah. I was pumped to work on my bit flip on Silas. I mean, hey, like, if it excites you, then you get more done, right? Like, I can write. 1,000 lines of code a day when writing a kernel, but I'll struggle to write 50 lines of code a day when I'm writing Linux user land applications. So typically, it takes less time for me to write an entire kernel to solve a problem that I could do in user space because I will actually be engaged and actually write the fucking code. So, like, at the end of the day, and that's, a th that's something I brought up before, 
if you can't get if if adding work or making something more complex makes you actually do the work in the first place, then that's probably more efficient than trying to do the least amount of work which you won't do any of. <laughs> now, that's not necessarily applicable if you have a boss who's a piece of shit or you actually have deadlines, but if your goal is to do research and figure things out and explore and learn things, then God fucking damn it, just learn things. Just Jump from branch to branch as you find something that looks interesting. ADHD the shit out of it. Just don't pay attention to anything for more than a day. Just jump between things and pick up things as you go. You don't need to sit down and pound through shit and hate yourself uh, to get good at stuff. I was just joking. I love my precious bit flipper. Hey, bit flippers, bit flippers are good. My bit flippers typically just flip bits. <laughs> like, my four line of code, randomly pick an index, randomly flip a bit at that index, is pretty much the most that I do for my bit flippers. Like, it's... Typically, I don't really need more than that. Anyways, um... We've got like an hour before raid starts, which means I probably have like 30 minutes before I should do things. Let's see if we can find an Oda in this phone quick. Um, I actually don't know if I have source to this, do I? Uh, la -da 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 -da. Settings, about, this is Android. We can, uh, we can do this fancy transition here. A little whoop. We've got Android 2.2.1. Uh, um, and that should... Uh, yeah, let's see if we can find the source to this. I think we might have downloaded it and then deleted it because we didn't have it. But we'll say um, uh, make their Android... Uh, I'm going to close these. Close that. I'm gonna move Motorola into Android and go into Android and make their um, SCH R880, which is this device uh, model. And then hopefully we can find the source to this, but it might be difficult to find. So I can't remember if we found this the other day. If we did, uh, it doesn't really matter, so. Zip, here we go. Um, so mainly what we're looking for at this point is we're looking for a file name. Um, so this is the Spica. Okay, this is saying it uses a Spica kernel. This is a, a, a 3.0 fork of it. This is the chipset SC3 or S3C6410. Uh, SSH, uh, ADB shell, um, cat proc CPU info, uh, cat proc, uh, hmm. So I'm guessing we don't have anything in here that's interesting. We're not going to have a, uh, we do have KL Sims, which is good. Um, we don't have anything else it doesn't look like. We don't have a config.gz, so we don't have good information on that. Um, so this, unfortunately, uh, it's hard to say if this is going to be the kernel that we're going to be on. It looks like people have updated it to uh, Linux uh, 3. We're on Linux 2.6, so there's a chance that this is a slightly different version, but uh, given it's a user port of this thing, uh, they likely haven't touched the drivers. And the other thing we can do is maybe look into um, if they don't have Linux in here. So like a, maybe like an initial commit sort of thing uh, where they say like switching to 3.0 or like initial commit, um, but we don't care too much here. So... What else? Mod probe config? No way. No way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm also not root, so I can't do it anyways. But that permission denied uh, is 
it just means the command's not found. There's no mod probe on this. Um, so it's a Fimage 3D. I'm pretty sure that will be easy. We probably can just uh, do basically the exact same exploit we just did. Um, let's just go into dev, and we're just going to uh, temporarily assume that this code is going to be accurate enough for us. It's probably not uh, exactly what we want, uh, but it's good enough, and good enough uh, is going to be good enough for us. So we're going to go into Android, SCH this, uh, git clone this. I uh, didn't want to put that pipe in there. And then we'll take a look at Spica. Wow, that's going to take a while. So let's take a look. Um, wow, we have a lot of things that are accessible to everyone. Is that a directory? Is that a file? Just RWX everything? Like, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so a bunch of TTYs. So Care3DM, um, that's going to be like a graphics thing. Graphics cards are typically uh, full of bugs and s this sort of stuff. Um, PTMX, that's a standard um, Linux thing. We're going to look for like custom code in here, but uh, we'll see. Um... Let's uh let's get a timer starting. Let's let's see. Let's do a stopwatch. Let's see how quickly we can get root. Um first first before we start that timer, we're going to make sure that this kernel at least somewhat lines up. Um cuz if it doesn't at least somewhat line up, then it's going to be a pain in the ass. And I refocus my camera, hopefully that will keep it alive. Okay. So we're going to look for uh, care3dm. Uh, okay, the fact that that doesn't exist is a little scary. Uh, we have... Let's see... Is that physical mem JPEG? Wait a minute. Do I have graphics? I do have graphics. Well, I can just map in pmem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, here we go. How long until we root this phone? Well, we're not root right now. Uh, let's uh, let's go get root real quick. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna quickly make sure we have a dev environment and we can get code executing on this. So we're gonna go into Android. We're gonna copy the uh, code from Motorola uh, Thrower and we're gonna copy that into Skitch. We're gonna go into Skitch Thrower. Um, make, hopefully this is going to run. I don't actually know if it will. We haven't tried to run a binary on this device yet. So first, let's just make sure that works. Um, do you want to have the timer up for the pressure? I don't know where, if that's going to show up with the camera. It might be close. Ooh, ooh, we'll just, uh, do that. Okay. All right, so it looks like uh, make run. Uh, no such file or directory. Fantastic. So that means we have uh, code running here. So we're going to delete everything really quickly here. Um, and all we want to do is make sure that we just have code executing. Um, let's just make sure we can do uh, print hello world. Make sure that that works. Fantastic. Hello world. Okay, we have code executing on the device, so now we just have to get root. Uh, to do that, we're going to see if we can open that... Um, th that's uh, pmem. Because <laughs> it looks like we have permissions, too. Uh, we're going to do let mute fd is equal to file open uh, dev pmem. And we're just going to see if that works. Uh, use standard fs file. Okay, uh, looks like we were able to open it, but let's do it with uh, open options new um, dot read true dot write true open. Uh, and that's open options. I think it's like that, something like that. Uh, Rust. I need to get open options quick. Um, uh, it is open. So we do new 
And then read true, write true, open. Oh, oh, I type it. Okay, sweet. Uh, so we're able to open that for read write, which is fantastic. So let's just go and, um, oh, wow. Well, now we just have to map that in. Uh, let mute uh, pmem is equal to mmap. Uh, we'll just do. Um, Let's do unsafe here. We're gonna mmap uh, standard pointer null mute. Uh, let's map in how much space do we have? ADB shell cat dev iomem cat dev mem uh, uh, cat proc iomem cat proc uh, mem. Okay, so system RAM, we've got this much RAM. Um, so we'll just map in like, uh, this looks like eight, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And then we're going to subtract off, uh, the start of Ram minus this. And then, uh, man, M map, oops, uh, prot, prot, read, prot, write, uh, map privates map, uh, that should be good enough, map private. The file descriptor will be uh, fd dot as raw fd, and then the offset will be zero, and then hopefully we can just mmap everything in. I'm not 100% sure if we'll be able to, but we'll, uh, we'll just see. Uh, pmem will print that out, and then this is going to tell me what thing I need to include, uh, which is this, as raw fd, and then, of course, um, get rid of the semi, and that failed to map it in, so let's, um, let's see if we can do 4k first. Okay, that's failing, and then does this have to be, uh, this? Do we need an offset? Ooh, uh oh we might be fucked. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, uh, why would that be happening? Must be at offset zero. A line? Oh, it literally tells you. And a multiple of pages size. Okay. Um, let's try this. Yikes. Yikes. I uh, cannot find allocation for map. The fuck does that mean? Uh, dev pmem. Is this not like standard default pmem? Is there like a way that I'm supposed to use pmem other than just standard mmap? I don't know if I need to do shared. Mm. What? Uh-oh. Could not find allocation for map. How does that even work, then? Um... Huh? What? Could not find an allocation for map. Let's just see if we can find that string. Maybe this isn't uh, real pmem. This is maybe a uh, made up one. Yikes. Um, that's not a good sign if we can't find that. Uh, uh, pmem. Android PMEM, PMEM device, PMEM data, all or nothing, size is PMEM size. Does it have to be eight megs? No, that doesn't make sense. We might just have to go find a real bug. Um. Cannot find allocation for map. I, I don't know if that's actually pmem. Uh, 
Uh, so this is where we get into a tough position of do we just go find a bug or do we try and figure out how the fuck that works? Um, let's see if this PMM JPEG exists. No. Okay, so I just don't think we have kernel so source right now. Um, could not find allocation for map. Fuck. Oops. MediaTek? I don't know what this is, but uh, that's fine. Um, this looks good enough. Uh, PMM and map. If there's a page off, yep, we saw that. And maps must be zero. Okay, so this is like MediaTek apparently. Um, if it's less than the VMA size, does not match size of backing region. Access prot, remapping file, map field in the kernel. Okay, so we are seeing, could not find, either no space was available or an error occurred. And this is, has allocation. Has allocation. Um... So is that only going to let me map things that exist in the kernel? We might... This is an ioctal handler. What's this? Get fizz. Um, if it doesn't have one, offset length is zero. Otherwise, grab this. Okay, so we can open pmem and then... Oh my god, you guys can't see like any of this. Um... Get fizz map. Uh, copy from user. PMEM region. Okay, do we just have to tell it? Do we just have to tell it uh, what we want to map? So, um, I really want this code. Uh, and I don't know how I'm going to get it locally. Um, driver staging dream PMM. So this is Android PMM. Okay, so we'll request for physical address of PMM region from process. Um, blah. So map. So basically, I think this is. Getting, okay, uh, PMM remap. So copy from user. And remap. Lock and data MM. I think I just literally tell it what I want to map here. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know where this code is. So, uh, PMMI octal. And. Shit. It's going to take a while to figure out how this thing works. Um, I really want to copy this code. Uh, can I just get clone this? Yes. I don't think this is actually media tech, but, um, you know, sometimes you just, you take what you can get. Um, this looks good enough for me because it's going to have this driver. And we can make do with that. This is what I was afraid of, was this really long checkout time. Um, but basically, what we wanted to start doing is getting ready to making this ioctal. So we're going to do uh, unsafe ioctal uh, standard pointer. Uh, or This is going to be fd as raw fd. And then this is going to be uh, uh, pmem map match case. So this. And then we're going to pass in this uh, PMEM 
region, right? Something in this ballpark is what we want to do. Um, Octal this, and we'll just see what that returns. Obviously, we need to actually make that ioctal, which is going to be a pain in the ass. And we need to figure out what the structure looks like. And if it's not in this file, we're just kind of not going to have it until we get these xrefs. Um, OK, so this is PMM data. Um, you, what? Do you actually just, this, what? You provide this whole structure? It might be easier to just find a different bug. Um, just because this is going to take like a while to figure out how to fill this in. Um, debug read, let's see here. Can we get any basic execution through these? If then ioctal, what's ID? Get ID file, okay. Um, get fizz, pmem data here starts, copies that region, which is pmem region. Map takes a pmem region. Oh, I might have been looking for the wrong thing. Uh, media tag, c tags, r dot. Uh, get, whoops, get checkout. Hopefully this, yes, fuck yeah. All right. Um, and then we're just gonna look for pmmioctal. Okay, now we're back to kind of normal shit. Nice, PMM octal. Okay, so this takes an MMEP region, uh, PMM region, and it's an offset and a length. Um, and then PMM map. And so the question is, is this gonna like have permissions and shit? Um, Cause I kind of hope it doesn't, but we're gonna take a look at uh, PMM map. And PMM map is this, and then we're gonna go grab our like dummy C program, which we'll put, uh, I guess, uh, we'll, <laughs> okay. You guys can kind of see the top of this, but uh, vim test.c, uh, include uh, sys uh, ioctal.h, include standard uh, io.h, int main void, we're just doing this so we can get what that ioctal is. Um, nice, and they use unsigned int for those, so printf percent %x, pmem map, uh, return zero, gc test.c, a.out. This is the ioctal that we want to use, const pmem map, u32 is equal to this in hex. And now we need to figure out what that actually takes. Um, so we'll go back to hmm, this. I'm going to temporarily disable uh, this camera um, just because it's going to be in the way for a minute here. OK, so um, nice. So let's go into. Uh, Bop, 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 Android, S-E-H, thrower, make run. Okay, so that's going to fail. Uh, this needs to be an I-32. Uh, in this case, we'll just as I-32 that. And then PMEM region, of course, doesn't exist. Uh, let's PMEM region is equal to OU-32. That's going to be good enough for now. Um, and then let's see what that actually wants as an argument. That's good enough. Okay, ioctal, negative one, perfect. ADB shell, D message, and uh, could request for unaligned PMM sub allocation. Fantastic. So 
Uh, what we want to do is figure out this PMM region structure. Looks like an offset and a length. So we're just going to do um, offset and a length, and then pass it uh, as a pointer to that. And we'll say mute just in case, even though it doesn't need mute. Uh, let's see what this does. Octal zero. Um, OK, so that uh, returned success. So what was it? Uh, offset and a length, 4,096. Make run. Actal negative one. OK. Um, remap requested from non-master process. Ooh. So let's also see if this works. OK, so since I'm not the master process, this thing might not work. Uh, PMM iOctal. So, OK, so we go into this. We control the region. Um, checks for alignment. If the length is 0, there's nothing to do. Uh, then go into this. Can't remap task is gone. So maybe you do have to be only the owner of the master file can remap the client FDs. Um, return zero. If it's not a PMM file, and if it doesn't have an allocation, do we just need to make an allocation? So if we do PMM allocate, Ah, is this just to allow me to allocate things in physical memory? Let's see if we can find uh, um, out of bounds on the uh, mmap uh, file. So if we can find a bug here, um, the size is start minus end, page off. We might be uh, in the wrong spot here. I, I don't. This seems to not function as I hoped it would. Uh, if the length is less than the VMA size, okay. And uh, what's the typing on this stuff? VMA size is unsigned, so that gets promoted. Okay, so we can't integer uh, that page pro. So basically, this will allow us to map things in to physical memory and get the address of them. Um, but it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do anything crazy with this, actually. So we can look in iOctal and see if there's a trivial bug here. Um, let's look at where arg is used. That's copying data out. This is copying from user. Uh, unmap. We'll ignore that. Get size. Um, total size, PMM allocates, PMM connect. This one looks fun. Let's look at arg here. Oops. Uh, this is called connect. Fget light connect. That is an FD. Okay, so that's kind of useless. Um, copy from user here. We're going to copy a PMM region. That's going to do a cache flush. And then that's going to do an ioctal. Okay, debug read. Um, wow, they actually bound checks their uh, debug reads here. Um, and they do a simple read as well. Wow, that's actually pretty impressive. That's something you don't often see. PMM setup, that's registering things for PMM. OK, this might not be as fruitful as we uh, hoped. There's probably still something in here, but it's not as shallow as a as I'm looking for for a bug in here. And we're on a timer. So ADB shell, CD dev, LSL. Um, let's try and find something else. Um, I don't know what that is, but it looks kind of interesting. Um, let's see if anything has it. Android SR this. OK, so we do have a speaker driver for this. So. Um, let's go and open that up quick. Um, do, do, do. This. 
ITC name. Okay, so probe remove ID. Some compass driver thing. Um AOT uh okay. Let's see what this is. Set delay. Atomic set, atomic read, um, arg, arg p, arg pointer, copy to user, this flag. Okay, nothing in here looks interesting. Um, uh, what about this one? The D variant. And we apparently don't have code to that. So oh, we do. Do we just not have tags installed? I think we made tags at a different level in the tree. So we'll just go here quick. Come on. Red Warhammer, thank you so much for the six months already. Hell yeah. Um, what were we in this? And we want to go to AOT Ioctal. That was the one we looked at. AKMD Ioctal. Uh, RGP. Copy from user. RW buff. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Um, and then our right. Whoa. Okay, that's. Rx data reset, copy to user. Okay, nothing like, nothing in there is screaming like egregiously bad. Um, let's go look at other drivers. The more letters in the driver name, the more bugs there are typically. Uh, let's look at multi PDP, which is radio. Do we have access to radio? Uh, actually, KR3DM. Looks pretty good there. Let's take a look at this. Wow, KR3DM. Okay, let's see if we can find code to this. Um, um KR3DM. So it's some sort of a spent, uh, sensor, but unfortunately we don't have source to this yet. Um, hmm. I'm really unhappy with the source that I have right now. Um, open source, driver. So that's the def config. Now, is this a specific commit that I want to be on? Let's see if there's a KR3DM mentioned in this. No. Um, okay, maybe we just have to find something we have drivers for. Um, oh, so that was the AOT thing. Yeah, so that's where we were. Uh, oh, these, these always have bugs. These are always really bad. Uh, Tiny64. Hard to say which one I'm in here. Um, G2D. Resources. Okay. Really? What's PMM JPEG? Doesn't exist anywhere. So I guess uh, maybe when you make PMEMs, these things like open up would be my guess. So these probably get added uh, dynamically. Um. So that's Bluetooth, graphics, input. God damn, do I just not have source to like, 
most of this shit. Multi PDP. Speaker DP uh wand ram phone interface device driver. Okay. Um written by Samsung, good sign. File operations. DP RAM. Deep RAM Air. This. Um and there's a read buff. Copy to user. Okay, F async, LP, pull, read, release, okay. Huh. Uh, DPRAM uh, character, read, write, so you have buff here, FIFA read user, Uh, kernel read to copy. If the size of the buffer is greater than the length, uh, then use the length. Otherwise, size of buff. Okay. Smaller the two. Kernel read. Okay. VFS read. What is this? Okay, that's true to this user. I think that's plumbing through. Um, Memcopy adder, one DRAM adder. Okay, nothing's like too crazy there. This deep DP RAM. Let's look at right. FIFA right user. Okay, that looks pretty boring to me. I really want K uh, care three DM. Have you seen multi PDP in here? Um, VTTY. What what are these? And I think these ones. Um. TTY operations. I think these this buffer might be. Checked. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I don't know whether or not these are user addresses or if they've been validated. But, like, obviously it's using a pointer here. Uh, the question comes down to whether or not that is controlled. So I'm not quite sure. Um, damn, it's not looking good. I feel like Care3DM is uh, where we want to be right now. Video zero. Um, oops. Can't I figure out the device through these fields? I think I can, right? So, like, multi PDP was a, uh, Okay, type, subtype, ID. I guess I don't want that one. Multiple operations. Oh, what's this? PDP FOPS. Who registers this? Multi PDP. Oh, this is what I was thinking. Dynamic miner, uh, 255. Okay, and this owner is this module. Okay, so we have an octal here. We have an arg. We have PDP arg. ID and an IF name. Um, Don't want to look into that too much yet. PDP adjust. Okay. Wow. These things do like nothing. Uh, so we control PRG. I guess the ID has been adjusted. And then ARG is the PDP ARG. 
Nothing too egregious there. I mean, obviously these could be indexing using that, but it looks like they're actually looking them up in a list. But mainly I want to try to figure out what devices actually are registering these video devices. Um, and I don't know of the best way to do that. Hmm. Because it will just be, someone will register video, but obviously that's gonna be all over the place. Um, I thought I could use the, like, hmm, minor file operations, misc register, it's like, where's the 10 and the 132 coming from, or do we not know, miscellaneous device, Registering this. Um, create a device class here. It's been a while. Finance this class, if, if this has it, which probably doesn't. Uh, okay. Um, whoa. And I, yeah, I really want to get the um, video for Linux, really. Yeah. Um, virtual video for Linux, yeah. I don't have grep. Um, KR3DM. I, I really want this. This is going to be where bugs are. Let's just go to GitHub and we'll go find KR3DM code. Mm hmm. That kernel's probably good enough for us. Linux Samsung ICS. Yeah, what is this? Uh, R880. Let's just see if we can find that then. Maybe this is a good way to search for stuff. Um, uh, Blah, blah, blah. Okay. We can just grab this, I guess. 2.6 XX. And this is for a P1000. Um, let's see if we can find chipset information on it. It's a tablet. Uh, an A8. Really? PowerVR SGX. Okay, so we're going to look at um, uh, R880. Let's see if we can find the acclaim in here. Here we go. Acclaim, and I wonder if they have the same GPU. They were released basically at the same time, so that's good to see. Um... Not really seeing any info on that. So, anyways, we're just gonna grab this code quick. Um, it, I'm sure if we did enough searching, we'd be able to find it. But I'm trying to find the easiest bug. Uh, I feel like that cloned really fast. This must be actually from. Samsung. And what are these? Fix, 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 fix. Bunch of fixes. Okay. Um, okay, so now we should hopefully be able to find our uh, this. Care 3DM. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is what I want. This is where we're going to find a bug. 
Oh, it's acceleration? Okay, maybe there won't be bugs here. I actually don't know how you'd fuck up an acceleration driver. Uh, but we'll f we'll see. Get delay, set delay, ioctal. Uh, delay NS. Get delay, read repeat. Um, arg. Copy to user sum. Oh, well, there's nothing here. Well, that was all for not. You serious? There's the probe. Disk dynamic. Ah, so it dynamically will allocate that. That makes sense. Okay. Um. Son of a bitch. And here I thought we were in. Copy from user, delay nanoseconds, put user there. Damn, this is a tough phone, man. Is there anything else in here that's like really egregious? Done. Am I system? No. Um. Hmm. Why is my proximity? What's proximity? GP2A. Uh, some Samsung code. We have show. Doesn't look like that's overflowing. Um, no octals outputs via that or sysfs attributes. So sysfs is probably where we'll have to go if we can't find anything else good in here. Um, did we look at all these or did we not find these? I can't remember. Um, yeah, uh, we didn't find this. So this is new. Okay. Um, sweet. Oh yeah, it does everything. Yeah. Arg. Copy from user. JPEG args. In buff. Physical input buffer. Uh, I think this is game over. Um, I mean we don't know for sure yet. So that's out param. Decode JPEG, deck param, which is a pointer. Uh, deck param, is this used without copy to user? Um, yes. So that is a, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's, that's exact right there. Um, but I don't want to have to go through all those input constraints. So we're going to try and find a faster one. Um, so hopefully we can find an easier one with fewer constraints. Otherwise, we're going to have to deal with like a lot of corruption. Uh, okay. Read, write, not used. Yeah. Clearly the, the new kid, uh, wrote this anyways. So we know there's a bug there. Um, so that's code execution. Okay. Let's look for, uh, G2D. Oh, fimg 2 d Okay, I think I think this one I uh, actually did a bug in in the past. Um, copy to user. Get memory. Um, DMA map. So you copy from user. Token DMA info. 
fizz to vert on the DMA info, and then you map that. Oh, is this just what's uh what's this? You just uh you just give it a physical address and then it memsets it. I mean, I can. I feel like I can make that work. Uh, fizz divert. And this doesn't need, this is just gonna do a subtraction. Yeah, it just adds the identity map address, um, which obviously depends on the device. Um, but for, I guess that's arc 64. It's just gonna add the like 5,000 hex, uh, or f 5 million hex or whatever, whatever, 50 million hex. Um, and then that's gonna mem set it. So that gets us an arbitrary mem set. This, do we have an M map here? Um, if the reserve size is less than size, fizz to PFN, that, okay. Unsigned long, static U32. I don't know how big that is. Mapping is too big, okay. And then take that and map that. So this allows us to map in this fizz adder. Oh, do we control that? No. No, that's set up in probe. Uh, fizz diverts on this, this reserved uh, fizz adder. Okay, I don't, I don't really care about that. It's not uh, too trivial. Let's look at G3D. Oh, we don't have that. Um, PP. MFC. Let's take a look at this quick. Ooh, I think it's this one. Beautify source code. Okay. Octal, MFCI octal, copy to user, uh, in parameter, common args. Uh, error code, union of args. We've got like MPEG stuff. Okay. Um, in param, ret code, ref args, ret code, encode args, deck init. I'm just looking for something easy. I'm sure there's bugs here. I'm looking for something easy. Uh, no pointer DRFs there. I really just want to see a, a left-hand side pointer. Buff type. Damn, none of these are trivial. Um, set config. Okay, so now we're going to look at the easy ones. This one's just getting a mutex. Pass in inparam.args, which then has this arg structure, which then gets cast to this config arg, which has a bunch of ints. Fuck that. Um, get config deck exe, exe decode. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff to set up in here, but probably some bugs, maybe. Uh, deck arg. Um, Heck, arg. Is that pointer controlled? It's a reference to the inparam args. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's getting information. Deck init. And what's this? Args in init arg. I just want some fucking pointers, man. They seem to have like flattened everything out here where they don't have any pointers. Okay, I guess maybe we can go and just do uh, G2D, this one, and just find Ioctal. Um, oh, this gets you the size, sweet. So we can read those. That's set memory. And then that breaks. If ret is zero, return zero. Okay, ret is zero. 
if it was successful, then we go through here. Okay, so basically this allows us to zero something in memory. I don't know. I actually got to go to raid. Um, yeah, it's raid time. All right. I'm going to wrap this up for now. Maybe I'll uh, pop on later. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll be streaming tomorrow for sure. So see you all in a bit. Sorry for the abrupt ending, but I did have a timer, time limit. <laughs>